Hi, I'm James N. Green, professor of Brazilian history at Brown University and the national co-coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. And this is Brazil Unfiltered. This week, I turned 70. I was born on November 22nd, 1951. That year, it was Thanksgiving. When I was young, I understood that my mother went to the hospital, gave birth to me, and then went home to fix the Thanksgiving dinner for the family. When I learned that I was born at 1030 at night, I realized that it couldn't have happened that way. Such is the innocence of youth. Becoming 70 is a big deal for me. I think of my grandfather when he was 70. He seemed so old at the time. And yet I don't feel that about myself. Anyway, today, instead of talking about the current situation in Brazil, I wanna answer a question I get all of the time from Brazilians. How did you get interested in Brazil? It's a rather long story, but it explains a lot about why I'm so passionate about the country, why I teach Brazilian history, and why I helped found the US Network for Democracy in Brazil, along with 200 other people at, on December 1st, 2018 at the Columbia Law School. So settle back and listen up. It's a story about the 1960s and 70s, politics and passion, travels down the Solimões River, and romantic notions of revolutions. I hope it won't bore you. So I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. It's a port city on the East Coast of the United States to a Quaker family. My parents were school teachers and later school administrators. So it was a very normal middle-class family. Quakers are historically pacifists. So I was brought up at a young age with a real acute sense of social justice empathy with the Black Civil Rights Movement, learning about the history of the peace movement in the United States. At the same time, I knew I was gay. And I knew this at a very young age, but I really couldn't deal with that. Uh, it was too hard for me to accept that idea. So instead of dealing with my own homosexuality, I found myself identifying with other people's oppression and discrimination. And that kind of impelled a lot of the activities in my life. Uh, when I was in high school in 65, I got involved in the anti-war movement, protesting in Washington, D.C. Uh, against U.S. intervention in Southeast Asia and Vietnam. In 1971, uh, when I was in college, uh, I got arrested in front of the White House, along with other Quakers, uh, for refusing to leave the area, protesting the war in Vietnam. And then a couple of days later, I was arrested in front of the Selective Service, which was the agency of the US government that drafted people into the war. I also had become radicalized by the war in Vietnam and decided that instead of uh, registering with the, uh, with the government to be called up to serve in the army or to do what they called at the time alternative service for pacifists, I decided to turn in my draft cards, the cards that I had to register and to refuse to collaborate with the system at all. And normally, if you did that, you would be put into jail in a federal uh, penitentiary for two or three years. But it turned out that that same year that I decided to do that, they changed the system of drafting people into the army, made it a lottery. And so certain people whose numbers came up were drafted, others were not. And so my number didn't come up and I didn't have to confront um, the possibility of serving time in prison. And I must admit, I was really afraid to do that. I really didn't like the idea of being in prison, but I had a very strong sense that was the right thing to do. So I went to college. It was a Quaker school in the Midwest, in the cornfields of Indiana. I studied political science and German, traveled to Germany in my junior year and really didn't like or identify with the German culture. I kept on thinking that everyone that I met had been a former Nazi or person collaborating with the, uh, the Hitler regime. And so I really couldn't find my place there. And then uh, I decided that since I thought that the next way that the United States would intervene in the world after Vietnam would be Latin America, I decided the next summer to go to Mexico to learn Spanish, uh, living in a city called Cuernavaca near Mexico City. And it was a language school that also had afternoon courses. And among the people who were there offering these courses were people involved in liberation theology in Latin America. This is where I learned about Paulo Freire. I learned about political situation in various countries in Latin America, and it politicized me a lot. I met a lot of Catholic activists who have been serving in missions in Latin America, but involved in social change. And their, their influence on me was really great. When I finished college in 1972, 
a group of young radical Quakers and I decided to form a commune and live in Philadelphia, where we formed a Latin American study group. So there were eight of us, and each week on Tuesday mornings, one of us would organize a presentation about a country in Latin America, and I chose Brazil. And to this very day, I have no idea why I did that. Um, to a certain extent, I remember Carmen Miranda being very fascinated by this crazy Brazilian woman with a basket of fruit on her head, singing and dancing. My mother had done a course in, in for her master's degree. I remember very distinctly coming down on a Saturday for lunch and being all excited because she had just learned that the Portuguese crown had moved to Rio de Janeiro and had set up an empire in Brazil. But besides that, I don't really fully know why I chose Brazil. But anyway, I chose to organize a presentation on Brazil and I started reading about Brazil, trying to learn what I could. And I came across the information that there was a group in Washington, D.C. called the Committee Against Repression in Brazil. Now, at this time, we're talking about 1973. There's a big anti-war movement all over the country. Millions of people are mobilizing against the war. And only a handful of people are talking about other parts of, of the world in which uh, the United States is nefariously involved in uh, interfering in politics and in the countries, invading the countries. Uh, and one of the uh, groups that existed was a small group in Washington, D.C. that had formed in 1971 when a political exile came to Washington. And his name was Marcos Ajuda. He had been um, arrested in 1970 and accused of being involved in an armed struggle organization. Although in fact, he really was involved in a group called Asson Popular, which had sent its members into factories or into the countryside to organize among workers and peasants. And so Marcos had been doing that in Sao Paulo and he went to help a woman from another organization who was fearing that she would be arrested. Her organization was collapsing and she was looking for a place to stay. He met with her and said, I really can't offer you a place to stay, but I'll try to help you out. And then the next week, when he arranged to meet her again, she had already been arrested and tortured. And she gave his name and information about him to the police in order to protect the members of her organization. So Marcos was arrested, brutally tortured. His family spent months trying to get him out of prison. And then once they, he was released, because they had no real charges against him, proof of any involvement in the armed struggle, his family convinced him to leave and go and live in the United States, where his mother was living already as an interpreter. So he went to Washington, D.C., and when he got there, he found out that President Medici, the thir third general in power in Brazil during the dictatorship, was planning to visit Richard Nixon in the White House in December of 71. So he organized with a group of Catholic activists, radical activists, and anti-war activists, a demonstration in front of the White House in the Lafayette Park. That's the same place that the Black Lives Matter people were, were gathered and uh, Trump sent in the military to clear them from the plaza. It's a park right in front of the White House. It was also the place in which I was arrested in 1971. And um, they organized a, an event there. They hung a uh, why, uh, they hung uh, strings between trees and and put on these uh, these strings the dirty laundry of Brazil, which were basically pictures of a, a simulated torture in Brazil from people that they had they had worked with. Uh, they kind of created the uh, experiences of what it would have been to be tortured on the parrot perch or other torture. So Marcus had done this in seventy one, and I reached out to him in nineteen seventy three. He invited me to come to Washington D.C. and then I'm there. I met this very articulate, charming, handsome revolutionary from Latin America, very committed to the struggle. I made it, many years later, I convinced to Marcus that I had a crush on him, uh, but I was really fascinated by the politics. This was like my dream come true to work with real live revolutionaries. I'd studied about Che Guevara, I'd studied about the social and revolutionary movements of Latin America, but this was an opportunity to really get involved. Now, previous to that, I'd in, I've been interested in going to Cuba because I'd heard so many wonderful things about the Cuban revolution. And they organized in the United States what was called the Venceremos Brigade, a brigade of volunteers from the United States, from the left, who would go to Cuba and help uh, either harvest sugar or to do some construction project for the Cuban Revolution. And I applied to go, but because I was gay, and at the time the Cuban uh, government and this organization which worked with the Cuban government were homophobic, they wouldn't let me go on the trip. They came up with some silly excuse. 20 years later, 
a cousin of mine who was on the committee that made the selections confessed to me that in fact it had been homophobia. So I had this situation in which I was increasingly interested in revolutionary change in Latin America, um, excited about all the transformations going on in the continent, identifying with the left, but not feeling really at home because the left or its sectors of the left were very homophobic. So this was the contradiction I was living. Um, around the time I met Marcos, I also came out and started joining a group in Philadelphia called Gay Activist Alliance, which was an activist group trying to fight against discrimination in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, but I was pretty isolated there. I felt kind of lonely. I, I uh, was trying to do work on Brazil. I did some petition gathering for um, a political prisoner named Manuel da Conceição. Uh, I would go to people and ask if they would sign a, a petition demanding his release from jail. And people would say, well, how do you know he was in jail? How do you know he was tortured? And so I learned at this moment how Americans know very little about Brazil. In fact, I was, it was actually the most unsuccessful campaign I've ever done. I think I only got two or three signatures because no one really would sign. At the time, I didn't speak Portuguese, and I really didn't know a lot about Brazil. But it taught me that one had to do a lot of work to educate people. So I was doing this work on Brazil, supporting what was called the Bertram Russell Tribunal that was trying to organize denunciations of torture in Brazil in, uh, in Europe, uh, organized by a commission inspired by Bertrand Russell, a pacifist and anti-war activist who had done a similar tribunal against the war in Vietnam. And so I worked with some other people in Washington, D.C. to promote this idea of having this international tribunal. Um, and then the coup happened in Chile. September 11th, 1973, uh, Salvador Allende was assassinated or he committed suicide, but the government uh, was overthrown and uh, Pinochet came to power uh, and stayed in power for 18, 18, 19 years. So all of us who were doing work on Latin America, whether it was a collective working on Brazil or one on Guatemala or Haiti or Peru or Argentina, all of us around the country immediately turned our attention to, to the situation in Chile. And quickly in the United States, because of the brutal nature of the regime, because a lot of anti-war activists had become politicized about the situation in Latin America, uh, the Chile Solidarity Movement grew, grew overnight to over 100 committees throughout the United States within a year of the coup of 73. And so I turned my attention to work on Chile and helped found a group in Philadelphia called the Chile Solidarity Committee. And we did denunciations of the dictatorship, U.S denunciations of US involvement, some naval officers from a, a ship called the Esmeralda, which had been uh, used to detain political prisoners and tor torture them right after the military came to power, was on a good uh, will mission. It was an old uh, uh, boat, an old ship that the government used to promote the country. And we organized um, actions against the, uh, against the arrival of the ship and also of the officers who were being honored in Philadelphia. So I got involved in uh, activities. One of them was meeting a group called the Living Theater. The Living Theater was a theater group, a radical theater group, anarcho-libertarian, that was based in, in New York, very, very famous at the time. They had gone to Brazil in 1970 to learn about Brazilian theater, ended up in Ouro Preto, the, the um, colonial town in Minas Gerais, where they had a winter festival. They participated in the winter festival, fell in love with the place and decided to stay were, you know, part of the 70s. They smoked marijuana. They were living in communes. It scandalized the local population, and especially the local priests who complained to the, to the military police who invaded one of their homes and found some marijuana and arrested them for possession. They uh, were detained, not hurt, although one of the members of their group or one of the people who was wanting to join their group, a Brazilian, was mistreated. And so when they finally got out of the country after a big international campaign for their release, they organized uh, a series of events and a show of, of a, a play, which um, had a scene showing the parrot perch, the parrot perch being a, 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 a form of torture in which a person is stripped, uh, his hands and his um, ankles are tied together and a pole is put through the crux of, of his arms. So he's, hanging upside down or she is hanging upside down. And then uh, electric shock is used to their most sensitive parts of their body to extract um, information. And Marcos had had been on the parrot, parrot porch, perch, he, I later found out. So I have an information, I have this person who I'm very 
incredibly you know, admiring of it, former revolutionary with a clear vision of the social change in Latin America. I'm working on activities around Chile and denouncing the military and, and uh, being sad about the fact that Salvador Allende had tried to have a socialist, legal socialist path to power in Chile, and it was, it was aborted by uh, the coup in 73. And then I met the Living Theater, which were people who had been in Brazil and were showing very vividly the kind of torture and repression. And all this had a very strong impact on me. In 1973, for example, there was a demonstration in front of the Brazilian embassy, and I participated in that demonstration uh, with a picket sign and 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 uh, denouncing U.S. involvement in supporting the military in Brazil. So all of these things kind of created in my mind this real a romantic, young, innocent idea of Latin America. I spoke Spanish fluently. I heard Portuguese and thought it was this amazing language, although I didn't really understand it. It really didn't make sense to me. I knew Spanish very well, but I couldn't quite understand the Portuguese accent. But I was very charmed by, um, by, this, by this country, its culture. And I made a very close friendship with Marcos's sister, Marchinha, who today is my best friend. Marchinha had been an actress. She was in Brazil when her brother was arrested and she was very involved in helping him get out of prison. And it really traumatized her. So she took off and went to the United States to be with her mother and then live in Berkeley. And we we, we spent time together and became best friends. And she was preparing to go back to Brazil. And so we agreed to travel together. And so we met in Guatemala and traveled through Central America together. Um, and then she went off to live in Venezuela for a while. And I ended up staying in Colombia for a few months, kind of learning about the country and, and what was going on there. Um, I tried to form a gay group there, but didn't have much success with that. Um, and before I go on, I just I forgot to mention something important, which is that while I was in San Francisco, um, uh, so I moved from, from Philadelphia to San Francisco in 1974. And partially it was because I wanted to go to a city where there are a lot more left-wing gay activists. And San Francisco was kind of a center of, of activism of the gay movement at the time. And I also wanted to find more people who were involved in political work on Latin America. And so I joined a, a Sol Chile Solidarity Group in San Francisco, which in fact had four or five gay members of the group, which was pretty unusual uh, for that time. And also um, I uh, joined a collective called the June 28th Union. June 28th is the day of the Stonewall Rebellion and it was a group of gay socialist men who were trying to uh, do political work from a progressive uh, perspective in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so one of our activities that I organized was a night on the second anniversary of the coup in Chile called Gay Solidarity with the Chilean Resistance. And we organized a public event, about 300 people attended, gays and lesbians from San Francisco. We had music, we had a, showed a movie. I gave a keynote talk. And the whole idea was to raise the consciousness in the gay and lesbian community of San Francisco about the situation in Latin America and why people who are activists should care about international questions. So I already had this experience of trying to build links between the United States and Latin America, not only because of US involvement in Latin America, but also because of the fact that even though we didn't know of a gay group in Chile, we didn't really know much about the gay movement in Latin America at the time, we understood implicitly that authoritarian governments would certainly make life more difficult for people who were having non-normative sexual relations, were involved in uh, uh, challenging gender norms in Latin America. It's kind of, a, again, another kind of naivete, innocence on my part. But on the other hand, it was something quite, quite um, pioneering to think about this kind of activity, to draw links between uh, the, the LGBTQ movement in the United States and people in Latin America. So my friend Marchi and I traveled to Central America. She went off to Venezuela. I stayed in Colombia. And then she joined me in Bogota and we flew to a city called Leticia in Colombia, which is on the border of Brazil, Peru, and Colombia to cross the Solimoy's River and get on a boat and travel down the boat to uh, the mouth of the Amazon. The Solimoy's is a tributary of the, of the, um, of the Amazon. And I kind of joke to people saying that the first big city I ran into in Brazil was Tabachinga. And for anyone who knows the Amazon, Tabachinga at the time was just a nothing. It was a tiny little village. Uh, now it's actually much larger. It even has a, um, a campus of the university 
uh, a federal university of Amazonas in, in Tabachinga, but at the time it was tiny. And so I had a first ex experience in Brazil, which was um, poverty of the Amazon, people living um, on the mouth of the river, uh, fishing, hunting, um, very, very difficult life. And we traveled down the Amazon to Manaus and then to, uh, to Santarém and then to Belém and then throughout the north and the northeast. And so this is the first thing that was pretty amazing. Well, first of all, I was doing all this work about Brazil when I didn't really even know Portuguese. I had five words in Portuguese that I had learned, and they were all kind of words like sacanagem, tesão, e, e tudo bem, malandro. They were kind of silly words that people taught me actually as a joke. Uh, and so with my Spanish, I started to learn Portuguese and became relatively fluent within three months. But what was particularly special about this trip was that Marcinha, having been involved in theater and in a group called Teatro Oficina, which was very, very important in Brazil and Sao Paulo, when we would get to a city, we'd find a place to stay, and then we would reach out to the local theater. She would see people and introduce herself, and they would be very impressed that she had been in Teatro Oficina, which was a very important theater at the time, experimental theater. And then they would offer us a place to stay. We would hang out with the people in the theater group. We would watch their uh, rehearsals for a play. It was just a wonderful time. And I would then, of course, meet a lot of gay men who were in the theater movement in each city. And I had a lot of fun meeting new people and having fun with those new people. So I was having a very rich cultural experience and a personal experience getting to know Brazil. Um, uh, when I look back on it, I realized I saw things and did things and I was really clueless at the time. For example, in Salvador, I went to the, the casa, the house of Rui Barbosa, who was a senator, a minister of finance uh, in Brazil, very, very important figure. And Marcia insisted we go and it was really important to her. And I went and I tried to read all the labels on the exhibition and found out that he was called the Eagle of, of the Hague. And I didn't really understand any of this. And then years later, when I became an historian, I went, oh my goodness, I was in his house. And now I understand what that reference was because he had been at a peace conference in 1907 in the Hague and was allegedly was very eloquent and therefore was called the Eagle of the, of the Hague. So I had this very rich political experience and I arrived in Brazil in August of 1976, which is exactly the moment when there's a process of liberalization, what was called at first the distinção or the, the loosening up, and then later the abertura, the opening, the, the changes in the regime in which the military was slowly relinquishing power as long as they didn't lose control of the liberalization project. And so we were really kind of confused and fascinated and Marcinha, having lived through the worst years of the dictatorship, was very concerned about security issues and we're very cautious, but we were learning a lot as we were going from one city to the other, seeing theater people doing theater uh, plays that seemed pretty kind of dangerous or maybe challenging the status quo. Uh, until we got to Rio, where Marcinha's family was from, uh, and I went to Sao Paulo to visit friends in Sao Paulo. And then went back to Rio, which I really liked, and tried to find a job there teaching English. And I wasn't very successful. So I went back to Sao Paulo and got a job teaching in Sao Paulo and then stayed in Sao Paulo. And the idea was for me to stay in Brazil for six months. I had a visa for three months. I got it renewed. Then I had to leave the country. So I went to, uh, to Paraguay, to Fossi Guasu, and then to Paraguay to get a, a visa renewal. Uh, and then when I came back, uh, they wouldn't let me stay in the country. I had to leave the country. So. I had planned to stay for six months and continue on this grand tour of Latin America, go to Uruguay, go to Argentina, go to Chile, go to Machu Picchu, the whole gringo trail that young North Americans and Europeans would, would follow as they were getting to Latin America. But I got stuck in Brazil. I tell people that I planned to stay there six months and I stayed six years. And the reason I got stuck in Brazil is because I really liked the people. They were warm and friendly. I kept on thinking every man was gay because men touched each other and they hugged each other, even though they weren't gay. Um, people were friendly to me, even though Brazil has a very strong nationalist um, sentiment against foreigners. People were very nice to me and embracing. And, um, and I was experiencing this amazing situation. In the United States, the 60s had kind of, in the mid 70s, it started to collapse and people were going back to 
people who had been involved in the counterculture were looking for good jobs and there was a consumerism coming along and Jimmy Carter was president, but he was having difficulties maintaining kind of on a progressive agenda. The stage was set for Ronald Reagan to come to power in 1980. So I lived the sixties in the United States, been an activist, had been involved in the counterculture, had lived in a commune. And then I go to Brazil and all of a sudden the same thing is happening again. There's an opening up, people are asking new questions. There's the possibility of new social movements emerging and I'm following that. So I was just absolutely fascinated. And Sao Paulo uh, didn't realize it at the time, but was really the center of all these changes. I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to share my story with all of you. Brazil changed my life. To a great extent, the activist and scholar I am today is a product of both my experience in Brazil and my work to build international solidarity networks in support of democracy in Latin America. Just thinking about Bolsonaro as president makes my blood boil. This is one of the reasons I created Brazil Unfiltered. I want to spread awareness about what is happening in Brazil to English speaking audiences and help defeat Bolsonaro. It's very important to me that Brazil Unfiltered is free and available to all, not behind a paywall. If you can, please support us at patreon.com slash Brazil Unfiltered. All of the proceeds go to my amazing producers who make this possible. We are completely independent from corporate media. Even $5 a month would go a long way and would help us to continue to come out with new material on a weekly basis. If you're not in a position to donate, that's okay. So let's return to my story. I had just moved to Sao Paulo, but I didn't realize that it was the center of the opposition to the dictatorship. And so I ended up finding a, an apartment with a group of young students from Uberlândia, from Minas Gerais, who were living in Sao Paulo. And um, a couple of them were gay. There was a woman who was not gay. And uh, so I got a kind of a sense of the world of gay life in Sao Paulo. And while I was there, I met uh, a person who became my boyfriend. He was uh, a student and a journalist and was working for a uh, a newspaper, an alternative newspaper, a kind of counterculture or monthly alternative paper called Versus. And he saw me and was interested in kind of meeting me and made up a story that he wanted to interview me for the journal, but it was really, I think, to, to get to know me better. And, and we started being together, dating. Um, now he was kind of in the closet at the time. He didn't really want people to know about him. And it reflected the way in which the Brazilian left, this was a leftist uh, publication. Uh, the Brazilian left was homophobic, that there was the kind of the culture was to consider homosexuality um, uh, immoral or a sickness or uh, people who had kind of dysfunctional notions of their gender, uh, very strong kind of male centered toxic masculinity culture that was there. And I think he he suffered from that. And so was very much um, interested in having this relationship with me and went out of his way to be with me, but at the same time, kind of keeping it from people. So I so through him, I um, started getting to know more people on the left. He introduced me as just a friend of his that he had met, and uh, not as a boyfriend. And some people figured it out pretty soon, but most, most people didn't know that. And at the same time, um, I... Uh, was in contact with a person named João Silveiro Trevisan, who people will know in Brazil as a very well-known writer, uh, who had done a film in the early 70s and it suffered censorship and persecution. And so he left the country and went to Berkeley and was living in Berkeley, California, where I met him. Actually, Marcia introduced us. And we, we had an affair. And um, it was like the first Brazilian man that I had an affair with. Um, and then when I came to Sao Paulo, I stayed with him for a few days. He actually was the person who told me about this group of people looking for more roommates to help split the rent. And so um, we were we were together off and on, but wasn't nothing serious. Um, and then um, I met uh, this other person who became my boyfriend. Um, Trevisan had tried to form a group just before I arrived in Brazil, and it was unsuccessful, or just after I arrived in Oh, I, I arrived in Brazil, I had to go back to the United States to get my visa. And while I was away, he had set up a group. It was unsuccessful. And then the next year, um, he tried to form a second group and I joined that group um, and it became the group Somos Grupo de Afirmação Homosexual, 
We Are, the translation group of homosexual affirmation, which is the first politicized LGBTQ group in Brazil. And so I wasn't the initial founder of it, but I was a part of the initial founding group of people. The, the group had a different name, but when it became Somos, I was a part of that process and in the meetings that chose that name and was involved in doing that. So again, I was in this situation where I was involved in the gay movement that was emerging at the time, the first politicized gay group that was trying to figure out how to do LGBTQ politics in Brazil. And at the same time, I had this boyfriend who was kind of in the closet and secretly uh, having this affair with me, but was very much connected to the left. And at the same time, uh, the student movement had reorganized in Brazil and was mobilizing, especially against the imprisonment of some students and a young member of the working class who were doing some leafleting in 1977 in the industrial center of Sao Paulo, uh, in a group of cities surrounding this, um, this, the center of Sao Paulo. They were arrested for allegedly being subversive and were tortured. And the student movement mobilized significantly for them. And so I, with my boyfriend, uh, went to demonstrations and I can remember uh, shouting out, um, down with the dictatorship, abaixa dictadura. But I had an accent. And so someone turned to me and looked up and I'm kind of tall. I said, my God, we even have gringos here against the dictatorship today. And so it was very exciting to be a part of this movement, to participate in the student demonstrations um, and, and to have this connection uh, with my boyfriend, who was also worked in the theater as a, uh, the manager of a, of, a, of a theater. And so I went to many plays and we, I saw the cultural renaissance of Sao Paulo at this time when many new plays were, were uh, being produced that were critical or politically challenging the regime. And so I lived this very exciting moment of seeing the LGBT movement be formed and also being connected to the movement against the dictatorship. Um, my visa ran out. I had to go back to the United States. And um, my boyfriend agreed to meet me and travel with me in the United States to meet my family and to, to do some traveling. And I remember when he got off the plane at JFK and, and you know, came down from the escalator or from the, yeah, the escalator, he said, do you still love me? And I said, of course I love you. And he said, well, I have something very important to tell you. I've just joined a revolutionary organization. And I went, oh my God, this is so cool. And so we went back to a, a friend's house and we spent the next four hours fighting and negotiating whether or not I could join his organization. And the organization he had joined was called at the time, the Workers League. And it had been the group that had organized this leafleting uh, in the uh, working class region around Sao Paulo, where people were arrested and uh, about which I had demonstrated. Um, and this group had started working with the newspaper Versus and had influence in Versus. And so uh, my boyfriend was recruited uh, to this organization. So I said, I want to join. He said, no, you can't join. I said, well, why not? He said, because you can't. And I said, well, wait a minute, you believe in proletarian internationalism and the working class has no borders and you're a socialist. And um, the group was kind of Trotskyist, so it had a very kind of radical perspective. I said, well, then, you know, I should be able to join this organization. So we negotiated um, an agreement that I would come back and work with the with the newspaper discreetly. And that was my conditions from coming back to, to Brazil, uh, which I was really missing and I was just loving it. I was in love with the music, the Brazilian popular movie, music at the time, the theater, the culture, and this whole exciting moment of another 68. It was like the world was exploding around us. Everything was happening. The gay movement was exploding. Everything was happening. So I came back, got involved in the gay movement um, in Sao Paulo and started working with this, this uh, newspaper, Versus, and helped write one or two articles, one article about the gay movement. I wasn't very important in the, in the newspaper, but it was a connection. And then my partner left the country to do something abroad. And, uh, and while he was gone, I made friends with people in the organization, including people who had been arrested the previous year and were uh, released from prison. They were arrested for being leftists against the government. And one of them was sharing a, the apartment with the leadership. And so I went to um, this person who was in the leadership, one of the founding members of this group, the Workers uh, 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 League. And I said, I wanna form a gay caucus or a gay group within uh, the organization. By that time, the organization had become legal through 
organizing what was called the Socialist Convergence, and which was kind of a broad-based umbrella group that would uh, take advantage of political openings that were taking place in the country and offer uh, a left-wing uh, critique of the dictatorship and offer the ideas of establishing a workers' party and, and doing other things. And so she said, For, sure. And I told her about my boyfriend. And she said, well, I can't really talk to him about that because he has to come out to me and I'm not going to, you know, out him. And, but she gave me the name of four or five other members of this organization who were gay. And I met with them and we formed a group, which later became known as the gay faction of the socialist convergence. And this, as far as I know, this is the first LGBT group of any political party and certainly of the left in South America. Although Earlier in Argentina in 1967 and 68, there was a group called Nuestro Mundo, which was formed by ex-members of the Communist Party of Argentina who were involved in the, um, the postal union. And so one could argue that perhaps um, that group was an earlier group. It was certainly the first politicized group in Argentina, but this was very specific because it was within a left group, whereas the people in Argentina had been expelled or left the left and were organizing autonomously. I had a strategy of trying to organize within this left group for them to adopt a program for LGBTQ rights. Now, when they were formed uh, the year before, someone asked to include in the program the question of the defense of, of, of what was called at the time homosexuals, because that was the generic term people used for gay men and lesbians. And um, and uh, it was kind of confusing the way it happened, whether or not the person who was leading the meeting warmly accepted this idea or was reluctantly accepted it. So officially in the founding program of the Socialist Convergence was an item uh, kind of tacked along with defense of women and, and black people and Indians, what I would call the et cetera's, the homosexuals, which were really considered at the time um, the margin of the margin. So when I joined the faction, my goal was to do two things. One was to organize within this political organization to raise their consciousness about homosexuality, about LGBTQ issues. No other person was doing this in any other organization in Brazil fighting against the dictatorship. And at the same time, helping the gay and lesbian movement be more politicized because it was a very new movement with some experienced people like Trevisan, but many people who had lived through the period of the dictatorship had no real political uh, awareness and were trying to figure out how to organize a group. And so the strategy that I developed was to encourage the, the movement, Somos, to interact with other social movements that were emerging at the time. A women's movement, a feminist movement, which was becoming very strong and criticizing uh, the sexism of the left, although most of these people were leftists themselves against the dictatorship, a very important black movement called the United Black Movement, which also considered themselves a critique of the dictatorship and for a more just society, but arguing that the left had not understood the question of race and only emphasized the issue of class and didn't understand how racism operated um, and, and other movements. And so one of the things that I encouraged the group to do was to think about building alliances with other social movements and not being isolated, not just focusing on people's own internalized homophobia and the ways in which they had to deal with dis discrimination in their family or in the workplace or in society, but also how we could build a broader front of an alliance. And in this way, although I wasn't the only one making this argument at the time, in fact, the first gay publication called Lampion d'Ashkina uh, also in their first editorial called on the emergent gay movement to build alliance with, alliances with, with blacks and women and the environmental movement. No one was doing that in practice. And so my goal was to see if I could in practice in real life, make that happen. And so one of the things, for example, that I initiated was at the time uh, Lampion was being charged with a violation of the National Press Act. And they were uh, their editors were being asked to give depositions and were threatened to be imprisoned for violating the National uh, Press Act for publishing a, a, a journal that was attacking good morals and customs, uh, contra moral y bon costumes. And so um, people, well, what do we do? And I said, well, let's organize a petition. Let's go to all the other 
press, all the alternative press, and get everyone to sign in solidarity with Lampion. And people thought, well, you know, maybe they won't, or maybe they'll, you know, laugh at us. There were people really feeling the a tremendous amount of homophobia that they experience in their lives, in their schools, uh, in their neighborhoods, uh, in their families. And therefore, we're really kind of hesitant to do this. They said, well, let's try it. And so we actually went out and went to all the different newspapers and everyone signed uh, the petition supporting Lampion. So that was a very important first step. And then they were organizing the second meeting, uh, second pu public demonstration on the 20th of November in 1979 to celebrate the day of black consciousness and the birthday or the, excuse me, the ex execution day of Zumbidos Palmares who was killed in 1695 and about which I recently did a podcast and YouTube program. And so the black consciousness movement was organizing a demonstration in the downtown area a year after they had organized a similar one kind of launching the movement publicly on the steps of the municipal theater. And this was kind of a free speech zone, a place that traditionally had been protected against police repression. Now the military regime is loosening up. It's, it's still arresting people, it's still torturing people, but it's also trying to find ways to ease itself out of power. And so the black movement organized a demonstration that year. And I said to the people in Somos, we should go and we should carry a banner against racial discrimination. We should sign it, Somos, Group of Sexual, to, to affirm who we are as a group and show our solidarity as another group that is marginalized and discriminated against in Brazil. And so we went to that. Um, we produced a, a little pamphlet. I helped write the pamphlet and we mimeographed it at the headquarters of the Socialist Convergence. And, um, um, or maybe I did it at the University of Sao Paulo because at the same time I was studying for a master's degree at the University of Sao Paulo. I don't remember where I ended up doing the, the, the little lamp, uh, leaflet. And we talked about the, the need to build solidarity between homosexuals and the black movement, recognizing that there were black homosexuals and that we also had a lot of things in common uh, that we needed to show our solidarity with each other. And I'm not really sure what the black movement uh, thought of that. I think they, certainly no one was hostile towards us. I think they were kind of scratching their heads and saying, well, who are these people? What are they doing here? But that's fine. And, but it was a first very important attempt to have a dialogue. So the movement is picking up speed. The political situation is, is, is getting more dynamic. There's been a series of strikes by the labor movement against the government's economic and uh, labor policies. In 1978, there's a general strike of the workers in the car industry in 1970, uh, led by Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, who's the president of one of the, of, the, of the trade unions there. He becomes a national figure because the strike is relatively successful. In 79, there's another series of strikes. And then in 1970, there's a third wave of strikes in Sao Paulo uh, and all over the country, labor is organizing, students are mobilizing, social movements are organizing against the dictatorship. So in this context, uh, Lampion has called for a national meeting of gay rights groups, groups that are organized, lesbian and gay groups that have formed and are organized. And uh, people in Sao Paulo went to a meeting in Rio and then volunteered to sponsor the first national conference in Sao Paulo during Easter week, which is a holiday in Brazil. And they obtained uh, the use of the medical school uh, in near downtown Sao Paulo, uh, strategically located, and organized the first national meeting of what was called homosexual organized groups. In other words, groups, not of just individuals, but of actual groups. And about 15 groups attended. Since the founding of Somos in 78, there had sp sprouted up all over the major cities in the country, political groups, 10, 15, 20 people. Lesbians were starting to become an important part of the movement. At the time, there were very few trans people in the movement, but a movement was growing. It was a period of expansion. Uh, uh, Somos had, had inspired other groups to be formed. Somos had over 100 members at the time. It was really big. And so we went to that event, and it was exactly at the time when they had called for a third general strike of the Metal Workers Union. And um, 
And so the first day of this event, someone presented a motion to show support to the striking workers, which was a general consensus in among progressive people in Brazil to do that at the time. People were raising money for the strike fund, collecting food for the families of the strikers. And so a resolution was passed. And then during the, uh, the meeting, the two-day meetings of these groups, about 200 people there, it was a discussion about whether or not we should participate in a May Day demonstration in São Sao, in Sao Bernardo, which was the center of the strike, the place where Lula had been the president of, this, of the trade union, uh, of, the, of the metal workers union, that we should go there on May Day, which they were calling in the midst of the strike as a way to mobilize public support for the strike. So they called for a big May Day demonstration. There's a tradition of celebrating May Day in Brazil, International Workers' Day. And so um, and, and other times the president would actually go to a rally of workers and announce a, a uh, a pay raise across the board for all the workers in Brazil. So this was a very important moment. And so we presented an idea to participate in the May Day demonstration and it split the body with a group arguing that it was a bad idea to go, we would be badly treated. That was not the role of the gay movement to be involved in, the, in, in this activity. And in fact, if we went there, we would be manipulated by the, gay, by the labor movement, which I, don't, I never understood that argument because I don't, if anything, they, they would be afraid to have us there. Or they would be negative towards us, but certainly wouldn't be able to manipulate us in any way. Anyway, there was a vote, the vote lost by one point. And by that time, I had kind of polarized uh, with my activities, Somos. And so to avoid a split in the organization with a minority that was against uh, the kind of strategy that I was having, the fact that I was also talking about my ideas with people and inviting people to meetings of the socialist conversion. So there's a lot of fear that, that um, my influence was great over the organization. So um, we decided to organize a group called the Pro May 1st Homosexual Commission. Comissão de Homossexuais pro Primeiro de Maio. And um, we decided to go with two large banners. I personally went to buy the cloth and the paint and painted them. One said, against the discrimination of homosexual workers. Again, this was the term we used at the time. And the other one was against the, the, the fact that the government had taken over the trade union for illegally being on strike. So it was against the intervention or the control of the government over the trade union. And, and we all... We gathered 50 people, got on some buses. The 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 dictatorship had uh, tried to block people from going to this demonstration by blocking the roads, and it took a long time for us to get to San Bernardo. And then we joined this this march through the city of, of San Bernardo to the soccer stadium, which had been the place where mass meetings was held, led by Lula, who at, the, at this point was in prison for having violated the the uh, uh, labor laws for going on strike. And we went to this, this big soccer stadium with our two banners. And the whole time we had been afraid that we would be kind of laughed at or people would be aggressive towards us. But actually when we walked into the stadium, we were applauded. It's a very interesting story because several years later, I was talking to a professor, a woman who I think was a lesbian. She never came out to me, but I've always assumed that she was. She had a dear friend that she lived with. And, um, we were talking and she, we were talking about my activism as a gay rights. This was no, actually was uh, 10 years, 15 years later when I came back to Brazil. And she said, you know, a really important thing happened in my life. I was in 1980 in the May Day in the soccer stadium. And this, this group of gays and lesbians came into the soccer stadium with this uh, big banner against the discrimination of homosexual workers. And it was really important to me. I don't know if she was trying to come out to me at that time. She never really did. But I realized that we had had a big impact. It provoked kind of a debate, and it also provoked a split in Somos because a minority thought that this was a mistake and that my political influence had guided the group in the wrong direction. And so they left the group and founded another group and, um, and attacked our group. And they were largely um, led in this by a former, I don't want to call him boyfriend, but a person with whom I had had an affair, uh, Trevisan, in Berkeley and in Sao Paulo, who was very disappointed that I had, uh, in his mind, taken the movement in the wrong direction. And so I'm gonna fast forward to a moment, which I think is wonderful, which is that uh, this last year, Jean Willis organized a live uh, with Lula. And both of them are dressed in red, you know, 
Jean is in Europe in exile, Lula is in Sao Paulo. And the first thing uh, after they exchange, you know, greetings and abrazos, uh, hugs, Lula says, I want to show you, Jean, this picture that I have. It says here, look at this picture. It says, against the discrimination of homosexual workers. And he said, look at this. This is our union. This is our union to this in São Bernardo. I'm not actually quoting him exactly, but that's the sense of what he was saying. Look how advanced we were. But it wasn't just me that was advanced. It was the, the movement was advanced at this time. And it's a delightful moment because actually Lula is, is a revisionist. He's making up. He's inventing the past because the San Bar San Bernardo Workers Union was not involved in organizing this contingent. They weren't hostile towards it, but they didn't embrace us. But Lula, over the years, with a very powerful movement, which has changed Brazilian society and has changed him, wants to claim the movement as part of his legacy. And I think that's a positive thing, even though I would love someday to talk to him about this and remind him of the fact that he's kind of confusing history. But it reflects how effective the movement has been in the last 40 years in changing people's consciousness. So uh, people who left the organization kind of split. It was a crisis because we were the largest group in the country and some key people had left. But those who stayed at the same time, a group of women Uh, in the group decided to set up an autonomous lesbian organization. And so they left the group at the same time, unrelated to uh, this issue. And some other people who were more interested in kind of building a social network uh, also left. So the group was in, in a certain amount of crisis. And we decided to do two things. One is to come together to organize a celebration of two years of SOMOS. And because SOMOS was founded in, in, um, in May of, of 1978, so two years later in 1980. And so we organized a party at a gay club, a gay discotheque nightclub, and, and people were doing a show. There was kind of a drag show. All these things were happening, dancing, having a lot of fun. And then someone comes into the audience, one of the members of the group, and asks to have the mic and, and denounce the fact that he had just been arrested. And because he had a journalist credential, he was released by the police. But there was a series of repression of the police in downtown Sao Paulo. And, um, and we needed to do something about that. So we called a meeting about that. And we discovered that the head of the precinct in downtown Sao Paulo, a man named Wilson Hikachi, had decided he was going to clean up the downtown area by arbitrarily arresting gay men and lesbians and, and trans and prostitutes working in the downtown area at, because he felt that they were creating immoral Uh, situation in the downtown area. And so he had arrested, he arrested over the course of a month, 1500 people, illegally detaining them with no really serious charges, beating up many of the trans people who were sex workers in the downtown area in the, in the process. So even though the movement had kind of split, we all came together and organized a big demonstration downtown in front of the municipal theater where the black movement had organized a demonstration the year before. And, um, Uh, and, and people got on the steps and we had a prominent uh, speaker, an artist named Darcy Penciado, who was a very well-known uh, artist who, uh, and painter who, who read a declaration. We got Congress people and state legislators to support us, including Fernando Moraes and Paulo Sergio Pinheiro, who was uh, a very important human rights activist today and a very important uh, actress and uh, um, Uh, uh, entrepreneur named Ruth Escobar. They were all kind of supporting this movement. Darcy Penciada was at this event. And uh, a light rain kind of started coming over the demonstration of a couple of hundred people there. And people started saying, to the streets, to the streets. And so we all left this area and started marching through downtown Sao Paulo. And this is actually the first public political movement in Brazil the first demonstration. It's the Brazilian Stonewall. Uh, it's the first time people respond. Now, uh, a couple of years later, a group of lesbians will actually carry out what is also known as another Stonewall in Brazil, which is basically going to a lesbian uh, restaurant uh, cafe 
and denouncing the fact that the owners wouldn't allow lesbians to be there and uh, sell a, a, a newspaper they produce, a, a kind of a small bulletin they produce. And so they went and they, they organized an event there to denounce the membership. And that's another very important moment in which lesbians organize their defense. So this was the kind of the state of movement. It was a very exciting period of time. The movement um, grew. Somos was able to open a headquarters. The first headquarters was a large space in which people were able to meet and have parties, organize a film club, have debates. By this time, I had been doing a master's degree at the University of Sao Paulo. It was actually the way I was able to stay in the country on a student visa. And I had decided to go back to the United States to help organize political work uh, in, in the United States. And I, although I was very sad to leave Brazil, I left Brazil the end of 81 into 82 and went back to Los Angeles where um, for the next 10 years or eight years, I was a political organizer. I organized among uh, Latino workers from Central America and Mexico, uh, did union work. I was a county employee of the County of Los Angeles as a bilingual social worker and was a leader of my union and organized a rank and file movement in my union. But I desperately miss Brazil. And I didn't have the money to travel there. I worked for a position in which I only had two weeks a year off, so it didn't make sense to go to Brazil. I got involved in, in leftist politics there and was involved in an organization which was very much focused on day-to-day -day hard, hard work, doing political work. And by 1989, I was kind of burned out. I had thought there would be radical social change in Brazil and in the United States, and that didn't really happen. Uh, I was a little disillusioned with all my hard work. And so I decided that the only way I could figure out how to go back to Brazil was to become an academic. Uh, so I got a master's degree in Latin American studies at a state school called Cal State University, Los Angeles, and then applied to the doctoral program at UCLA uh, and decided to do my dissertation on the history of male homosexuality in 20th century Brazil, which was my first book. And when I went back to Brazil in 1993 to do preliminary research, I was very nervous. I had been out of the country 12 years. I wasn't sure that my old friends would embrace me, be happy to see me. And it was the most wonderful reception I could possibly have, have had. I, I just was enveloped by the love of people. Um, people who had worked with me in the gay movement, people who had been involved in the socialist convergence with me, uh, friends from the university, new friends that I made, people in the new gay movement that had emerged in the, in the 90s. It was just, a, it was an embrace that was just fabulous. So much so that every year, except for the last two years because of COVID, I managed to finagle to go to Brazil for my birthday and have a party in Sao Paulo in the house of a very dear friend of mine. Um, and all my friends come and it be, it's become almost a tradition for the last 20, 25 years to have this big birthday party where I bring all my friends together. What's important about all that is that over this period, I managed to find a way to integrate myself, my leftist politics, my commitment to social justice and equality, and also my, my sexuality, my personal life, my romantic life, to bring them into the to one, to be one person by forcing society to change and rethink the way they understood uh, questions of, of gender, the questions of sexuality, and normative heterosexual behavior. And I was also able to do that in my professional life as an historian, doing my first book on, um, on male homosexuality in 20th century Brazil, telling that story, and a series of other books that I produced after that, doing my second major book, We Cannot Remain Silent, Opposition to the Brazilian Dictatorship in the United States, which in Portuguese has a title, Apesar de Vocês, Oposição à Dictadura Militar Brasileira nos Estados Unidos, which is about the solidarity movement that I was a tiny part of in the 1970s, collecting those signatures to release Manuel da Conceição. But I realized that people in Brazil didn't know anything about the support that people had given Brazil during the dictatorship. So I wrote a whole book about that. And then my final major book uh, about Herbert Daniel, a gay man who joined the guerrilla fight, the armed struggle, uh, repressed his homosexuality while he was involved in that part of his life, underground, leading an organization, kidnapping the German and the Swiss ambassadors to get 115 political prisoners released, 110 political prisoners released. And I had found out about him as another person who lived this life of being gay and 
experiencing homophobia and rejection even by the left and therefore hiding his homosexuality as my boyfriend had done. And finally coming to terms with that after being involved in the revolutionary movement. Um, and all of this uh, brought another surprise because Juma Josefi was a part of his organization in Belo Horizonte and then in Sao Paulo. And I had wanted to interview her, but I didn't think it was possible. First, she was a minister of mines and energy, and then she was the president. And I really didn't have the access to her to see if she would be willing to give me an interview. So my book was almost finished. And um, I was following the situation in Brazil very closely. And in 2016, in February, I went to a demonstration of a group in New York called Defend Democracy in Brazil, which is a very hardworking group of Brazilians and some Americans who support them. They were organizing a demonstration in Union Square in, down, in, in uh, downtown New York. And people were asked to speak. I was asked to speak and I spoke. And then um, a black man took the microphone and said, I'm on a scholarship in the United States for journalism because of the programs of the Jilma Lula governments. I never could have imagined being here if it weren't for these governments and what they did to me. It's really important that we defend Jilma Josefi against the attacks on her government. So this was after the election. There had been mobilizations against Jilma Josefi. There were threats of impeachment and then a whole impeachment process unfolded. And so I, I heard that speech and I said, well, we've got to do something. And so I went back to, to, to Brown from New York and with a dear friend uh, and fellow colleague and academic, Renan Kinalia, we, we wrote a, a statement denouncing the process going on in Brazil. And at the time we were focusing on Sergio Moro and his persecution of Lula and his attempting to arrest him and to pressure him his releasing the conversation between Lula and Jilma. And we wrote a document saying that Brazilian democracy is seriously threatened. Now, at the time, we didn't know all the details of the way Sergio Moro was collaborating uh, with the prosecuting attorney to ensure that Lula would not be able to run for president by uh, quickly charging him and convicting him of corruption and then sending him to 500, well, sending him to prison, uh, uh, ending up being a 13 year sentence in which he served 580 days. But we, we wrote this and we started circulating it. We got tremendous amount of support uh, for that. Um, it was very, very important uh, that we did this. And so we took this petition to the Brazilian Studies Association, Hanan defended the idea of this association, taking a stand to support that. And that unleashed a whole movement uh, supporting other people who were already organizing in the United States uh, against uh, the coup against Juma Hosefi. And so in I in, in that process, I wrote a, um, a declaration, a, a statement about uh, the way I thought uh, Juma had been uh, unfairly treated, that the, it, by, the Obama administration was not being very clear about this question, was kind of vacillating on it, criticizing the U.S. ambassador to the OAS that said that there was a fair impeachment process. And um, I that became known by the a group of historians called Historians for Democracy in Brazil. And so they invited me to join them at a event at the presidential palace in Brasilia after Dilma had been impeached and was waiting the trial in the Senate. And so I went and they put me next to her on the platform and I was the second to the last to speak. I was extremely nervous. I had no idea what I said, but there was Dilma watching me and listening to me and saying, who is this guy who speaks Portuguese with an American accent? and knows all these things and said he's been involved in Brazil for 30 years. And so after that, I turned to her and said, you know, I kissed her, da, da, da. And then I turned to her and said, I'm doing a book about Herbert Daniel, who you knew. And she went, really? Who, how, who are you? How do you know about him? And, and I, I was very kind of, uh, kind of taken aback. And there were all these people wanting to get selfies with Joma. So I kind of stepped back and she was over, over in an area of the room people posing with her and taking pictures. And she called me over, she said, come over here. I want to know more. Tell me about this book. Is this book ready? Have you finished it? Is it in Portuguese? And I said, well, I have a copy with me. It's in English. She said, well, I read English. I can read it. She said, could you get it for me? And so I went to the bus where we were and got a copy and I gave it to her. And she said, I'm going to read this a little bit every night. 
And I said, well, I would like to interview you. And she said, fine. And she said, go talk to my, my assistant. So I went over this to the assistant and said, is she serious? I said, will she really let me interview her? And he said, oh yeah, she's serious. And so, um, so the event ended and we talked a little bit more. And then I scheduled an appointment to, to meet with her. It was supposed to be a 45 minute interview. And we ended up talking two and a half hours. She was blown away with how much I had known about Herbert Dunn Young, because I had been doing research for this book for eight years, almost 10 years. I had interviewed over 70 or 80 people. And, and at the end of the, of the conversation, which went in many directions, she said, I think I have a new friend. And I'm thinking at the time, like, you don't have friends that you need me to be or your new friend. What is this all about? I knew that she liked the opera. So I said, well, someday you need to come to New York. When you come to New York, I'd like to take you to the opera because I live in New York near the Metropolitan Opera House. Um, and so the next year she was invited to Harvard and I contacted her to say, I'd like to organize a tour of the East Coast with you to talk about your legacy as president. And we spent two, two weeks together. And in the middle of that, I invited her to the opera. Now, this is really smart of me. Like I'm thinking I'm going to invite the president to the opera. I can't put her in the high seats way up in top because she's the former president. And I spent a lot of money buying two really good tickets. So it was worth it. I said, this is, you don't get to have a dinner and an evening at the opera with the president of a country very often. So let's just splurge and let's do this. So we went to see an opera together. We spent part of the day in Central Park and we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was just an amazing day, an amazing two weeks. At one point um, in a restaurant, I, I said, everyone's taking selfies with her, but I don't have one with her. And so I posed with her. Someone took a picture of us kind of hugging in this in restaurant. And then I posted an essay on, on my Facebook talking about how I thought that she was treated with misogyny and disrespect, that any man doing what she did would have not suffered what she suffered. And it kind of went viral, not big viral, but little viral. And um, all of a sudden, someone sent me an email saying, hey, congratulations, you and Jim are in the newspaper together. And someone had taken this picture from my Facebook and, and put it in one of these kind of newspapers that you, you get in supermarkets. And it said that we were, we were girlfriend and boyfriend. And I thought, that's funny, because everyone knows I'm gay. That's not going to happen. Uh, and then the next day, it said we were, we were kind of serious. And then the next day it said we were engaged. And all of a sudden there were rumors that we were going to get married, which was like insane. And so I'm reading this and laughing and thinking it's hysterical because I'm supposed to be known for a, a gay activist. And, uh, and then uh, one of my students who's working for Piawi in, in Rio calls me and says, I want to do a piece on you. And when, when she calls me, I said, oh, have you heard the good news? Jim and I are going to get married. It was a joke. And she said, yeah, I want to talk to you about that. I want to do an interview. So she writes an article and she uses the, that phrase that I use as the title of the article. And this does go viral. Over 100,000 people read the article. Most people didn't read the article, but they read the headlines. And so more people thought that we were together. And so I had to jokingly go onto the internet and say, I want to make a declaration. There's a rumor spreading that I'm a heterosexual. I consider this to be an insult. I'm a known homosexual, and I don't want to be associated with being heterosexual. And so would you please stop circulating these false rumors about my sexual orientation? Um, Juma thought the whole thing was funny. It got a lot of attention for a couple of days and then died down. But what's nice about this is we really became friends. And so we get to talk, uh, to chat about what's going on in Brazil. Um, and I think all of this um, led up to what happened in, in 2018. And I'm going to kind of end this story around that, which is that it became clear and clearer that it was necessary to organize a solidarity movement with Brazil because Bolsonaro was really gaining force as Lula was condemned to prison, was not going to run in the race. And although Haddad, I think, did a very good job in the electoral campaign, was probably not going to be able to outpoll uh, Bolsonaro, especially after he was stabbed and then created a whole aura around him. And so um, uh, Gilma had invited me to uh, be with her during uh, the election, first round of the elections in in uh, Minas Gerais, in Belo Horizonte, where she was running for Senate. And so I went there to be there. We talked the night before. We were imagining she would be elected Senate. We're all excited about that. One of her campaign advisors started talking about the influence of fake news and how they hadn't fully understood how it functioned and how it was operating independently of the traditional way to do electoral campaigns. And then we got the very bad news that she lost and that Bolsonaro won. So on the way back to the United States, <clears throat> I organized a call for a national meeting 
to be held at the Columbia Law School in New York to found what became known as the US Network for Democracy in Brazil, which is a nonpartisan, independent movement uh, of Brazilians and people uh, uh, of people who support Brazil in the United States who were interested in defending the advances of the last 40 years, the social movements and all the victories that they've achieved um, and to support progressive movements in Brazil. And we now have uh, members and supporters in 45 states in over 200 universities all over the country um, doing wonderful things. We managed to open an office in Washington called the Washington Brazil Office, which does advocacy in the US Congress around issues related to Brazil. And the latest uh, effort that we were a part of was a letter that was written by Hank Johnson, a, a Democrat, uh, signed by 64 congressmen, basically calling on the Biden government to distance itself from Bolsonaro and wait for the elections for a new, more progressive government to come to power. So we've seen a really amazing movement emerged. Being the national co-coordinator uh, of this movement, uh, being openly gay, being respected as a scholar, um, having had been the president of the Brazilian Studies Association and for the last uh, previous five years, the executive director of that association, having deep roots among my colleagues in, in Brazilian studies in the United States and seeing the overwhelming support they give to Brazil, seeing the mobilizations throughout the country and seeing what's happening in Brazil with the perspectives of hopefully defeating Bolsonaro and seeing a progressive government come to power gives me a lot of hope. I'm not gonna abandon Brazil until I die. I love the country, it's my second country. Uh, I really love the culture and the people. I know all of its problems and its, its negative aspects. I teach the history of Brazil to eager students every year. I, in fact, I only teach courses about Brazil and Brazilian history at, at Brown University. And um, I'm very committed to fighting and continuing to fight for social justice. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to do Brazil Unfiltered. Brazil Unfiltered is an opportunity to educate people who are interested in Brazil, wanting to learn, learn more about uh, the country, its complexities, the current political situation. And so I'm gonna to continue to produce this with an excellent uh, producers who've been working with me on that uh, to provide information uh, to you about the situation in Brazil. Thank you for listening to my story. If you can support us, go to patreon.com backslash Brazil Unfiltered. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the video. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. Also tell your friends, colleagues, students, professors, or anyone else you think might be interested in the program. Have a great week. Until next time, até a próxima.